Now, lady, thank you so much. So what we've been doing in the run up to so now, of course, it's not just about what President Cyril Ramaphosa has to say to the nation today. Opposition parties also have a vested interest in exactly what is going to be said in in his speech tonight. And we have been speaking to opposition parties um, about what the expectations are, what their hopes are, although many have indicated they have no hopes. Um, they, um, because they've just been said that they, they've been so disappointed in the past. And I'm going to be asking the EFF as well, the third largest political party in Parliament, national spokesperson of the EFF, Sinawa Tambo, is going to be speaking to us about your party's expectations um, of tonight's SONA. Look, as uh, the EFF, we expect nothing uh, from Sil Ramaphosa. And of course, as we've already said, we're not going to allow him to speak because there seems to be a misconception in South Africa that every state of the nation addresses a reset button where Sal Ramaphosa can make empty promises, empty commitments, and it's a new dawn each and every single year. His term begins afresh every single sauna, which is why people keep on saying that they want to hear the president speak. Speak and say what? What exactly do people want to hear Sal Ramaphosa say? Because he has collapsed every sphere of South African society. South Africa has a 4.3 trillion debt obligation to foreign uh, loans uh, that it services on a yearly basis. To service the debt that we have as South Africans, we pay 300 billion, over 300 billion on an annual basis. That's more than we spend on health, that's more than we spend on education. Last year we had over 200 days of load shedding. Uh, electricity blackouts that have crippled our economy and destroyed businesses. Everything is collapsing under Sagrama Posa. Crime is spiraling out of control. He's exhibited himself to be a money launderer and a corrupt person with regards to Pala Pala Farm. What is it that people exactly want to hear that he's going to say that he hasn't said before? So he has no right to address South Africa. He has presided over the disaster of this country. So what state of the nation address can he give over a country as destroyed? What you have been saying, the points you are touching on, is the very same that your colleagues in other parties, uh, social issues, economic issues, political issues, of course, um, those are issues that they raised complaining about, that these are key areas the president needs to focus on, but also saying that they don't have much hope. Earlier this week, speaking at the mining in Daba, the president called on stakeholders to stop complaining but to come forward with their own suggestions. Um, parties, to my knowledge, have been giving alternative suggestions to what the ANC has been presenting at this point. Um, is there anything that you, any, any area that you find that, any overlap in terms of what the EFF has presented to what is currently on the table? Look, the reliance and call by Sil Ramaphosa to stakeholders of the private sector to intervene in the economic and political situations of South Africa is part and parcel of his naivety, where he thinks foreign direct investment will uh, revive South Africa's economy. It's naive. The only interest the private sector has is the accumulation of profit, which is why we're always opposed to the privatization of ESCOM, the privatization of our railway networks, the privatization of water provisions and all sectors of society. So as the EFF are the founding pillar of uh, our policy towards the economic development is of course massive industrialization. So the South Africa needs to develop the capacity to conduct its own affairs, to produce its own products and to manufacture its own uh, products as well, to ensure that we build an economy and create jobs. That's one of the most basic uh, things that we say, that we must be able to draw inspiration from nations that have massively industrialized, such as China. But on the en energy crisis, the EFF has of course said we're going to hold an energy symposium later this year. But part and parcel of what that solutions can be at uh, ESCOM and in terms of the energy crisis is the use of uh, gas through the car power ships, the ships that can provide electricity at a low cost in a cheaper way and uh, as opposed to the parasitic independent power producers which are currently controlled by the political elite and their handlers and uh, they are extracting profit from the state without being able to provide stable generation of electricity in South Africa. So that's one of the interventions we say need to be made. We need to be able to stabilize our debt without the constant increase of the repo rate. So as things stand, we're dependent on consumers and the people of South Africa to try and stabilize our economy in the interests of the financial sector exclusively. And that is wrong. So you cannot try and stabilize finances by trying to increase the repo rate in South Africa. So our people are living hand to mouth. The, the cost of living is inexplicable and is terrible for our people. We're in a state of misery every week. If it's not the fuel price, it's the repo rate that is increasing. So the middle class, the so-called middle class in South Africa that seems to think that it is stable, can lose stability over a lack of a salary for a month because they survive on loans which are constantly increasing in terms of the interest rate. So those are some of the things that we've uh, identified that the South African uh, ANC government is unable to resolve the crisis that is confronting the lives of our people. And, uh, I actually want to touch on this, sorry, 
I wanted to touch on the topic of the repo rate. Analysts that I've spoken to in recent months have been saying things like the, we, you always have something to save. You always have money to put away. But that's not been the case. And as you say, the middle class has now is now being most affected. We know we have an overwhelming poverty situation. We know what the situation is with the majority of South Africans. But the fact that the middle class is now being affected more than ever just takes things to another level. Absolutely. And I think it should awaken the middle class away from its uh, elitist thinking that they live in a separate world. Mm. It's, a, it's a salary of a month that can destroy someone. They can be unable to pay a home loan. They can be unable to pay a vehicle loan because the interest rate on those are increasing almost on a monthly basis in South Africa. So the fiscal policy of the South African Reserve Bank is not in the interest of the people of South Africa. It's in the interest of the financial sector. And the financial sector is extremely making extreme profits without contributing to the development of this country. So it's, it's unsustainable and we hope that the middle class or the so-called middle class in South Africa comes to that realization that their lives can become that of a person in the township or that of a person in the village in the space of a month or two. And that is the precarious situation they live in. That is the type of destruction that has been emitted on our economy by the ruling elite led by Cyril Ramaphosa. So Cyril Ramaphosa's resignation is of immediate need. So people must stop clamoring for Cyril Ramaphosa to address the nation as if he's going to say anything new. He's going to speak empty words, he's going to make empty promises, he's going to try and coerce the nation into giving into privatization, handing over our sovereignty to the private sector, which is only has an interest in accumulating profits. So we are saying there is nothing that Silver Makosa can say. A state of the nation address is not a reset button on a term of presidency. He must not speak. We will not allow him to speak and we will ensure that he doesn't. Let's move tack slightly. Um, we have 2022 national and provincial elections coming up. There's a lot of talk, lots of analysis, predictions that the ANC is not going to make the 50 plus 1 percent to to be the ruling party in the country. So coalitions, we see what's happening in municipalities. Um, and if if that has to then shift over to national and provincial governments, how sustainable do you think that would be for the country? Look, South Africa is currently in a political experiment, right, in terms of coalition. So it's an undeniable fact that the African National Congress is going to drop below 50% in the national government elections next year, possibly even less than 40, which means that we're going to have to get into quid pro quo relationships with political parties in order to ensure that service delivery is delivered to our people and the best can come out of reviving of our economy. So what we as the EFF would like is uh, stability, of course, across the country in coalitions, but because it's something new, it's bound to to have uh, inconsistencies and uh, fallouts every now and again and that is something South Africans must realize that their decisiveness give indecisiveness gives rise to uh, that instability so the EFF is going to be part and parcel of those coalition agreements we've already expressed that uh, we are ready to govern and our door is open to anyone who's willing to work with us and uh, if that uh, relationship is not mutually respectful is not mutually beneficial doesn't give other parties the opportunity to govern and is characterized by white supremacist entitlement like the DA in Gauteng or arrogance like the IFP in KwaZulu Natal that forgot that it is ruling through the ticket of the EFF, then those relationships will fall apart and new formations will be formed and we'll be kissing frogs in order to ensure that we can implement our socialist policies and the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF. But uh, what we want to caution South Africans against and especially political parties is that murder must never be a solution to political disagreements. So uh, we have received a threat and a briefing from the Minister of Police that our Secretary General's life, Marshal Jamini, is under threat because there's a misguided uh, understanding that he's solely responsible for the removal of the IFP in KwaZulu Natal, the upcoming removal of the IFP in KwaZulu Natal. And, uh, it's misguided and uh, part of a very illiterate understanding because it's a collective decision of the EFF to remove the IFP from all municipalities in Guazul Natal. So they can't kill us all. They'll kill him, they'll kill me, they'll kill the Commander-in-Chief, but the IFP is going to be removed from government come hell or high water because they've exhibited the arrogance of the DA, they've, they've exhibited being a lackey of the DA, and of course they're going back to their default setting of being collaborators with white supremacy. They don't want to enter any agreement or any conversation with anyone that doesn't involve the Democratic Alliance. So we're going to teach them that lesson, and no death threat is going to stop us, but we must impress upon our people that murder is not a solution to political disagreements, and we condemn that. Well, hopefully nobody will get killed, not you, your CIC or your SG. Um, 
on that very very issue um how are the investigations underway you said you speak you're getting a briefing from the national minister i don't know if you said today but at some point like what's happening in terms of action from the eff side on that threat on that alleged threat look we're waiting for that uh, he had made a commitment to speak further and elaborate to our secretary general as to what constitutes this threat who is at the center of it in terms of names and individuals uh, but it was a much broader threat about uh, him saying to our SG that they are going to be escalating political tensions in KwaZulu Natal, particularly after the decision we have taken to remove the IFP, and that our Secretary General's life in particular may be under threat since he's the one who issues the instructions of our collective decisions. So we are going to await for him to give that briefing. I've seen that uh, he's uh, trying to scapegoat or deny uh, those allegations, and uh, we challenge the media and we challenge him to confirm or deny whether he called our Secretary General uh, this past weekend and between today and this past weekend on Saturday. What was that call about and what was he briefing him about in particular? Because you can't say you're calling the Secretary General of the third largest political party in the country to discuss political tensions in general. That's disingenuous. There has to be a reason why you call him in particular. You call him in particular because you've identified a threat from him. You call him in particular because you've gotten an intelligence briefing that the decision by the EFF to remove a certain political party from power may lead to a loss of life. So we require honesty from him. We trusted him with that information when he gave it to us. Why he did not brief his subordinates at SAPS is beyond us. But uh, we took that as a serious briefing and we did not issue that statement as a level of uh, sensationalism. We issued it as a means to conscientize society and even those members of the IFP who may be at the center of the plot of killing the Secretary General that those are not politics. That's gangsterism, that's murder, and they must never form part of the political body of South Africa. I just want to go back to analysis and and um, polls. Has the EFF conducted any kind of research or polls um, into what your, your, your numbers will look like next year? Look, uh, we have conducted, of course, our own internal research. We've also sourced external experts uh, recently at our plenum, which we had, which is our strategic meeting to plan for the year. We did get a presentation from Ipsos on what uh, polling looks like for the upcoming election, what demographic changes have there been in terms of the EFF's relationship with the people of South Africa. And we are confident that the EFF will at a bare minimum be the official opposition in South Africa and at a bare maximum rule this country in 2024. That is our analysis internally and comparatively with the external research that has been presented to us. So we're extremely confident that 2024 is going to be a watershed year for economic freedom. We're turning 10 years this year. We are today inducting MMCs in the city of Johannesburg, the MMC of health, the MMC of safety and security. So we are preparing ourselves to govern and they were going to exhibit to our people how it looks like when EFF policies are implemented at a local level. And of course, in 2024, we will ensure that we implement our policies as well. Sinawa Tambo, National Spokesperson of the EFF. Thank you so much for your time, sir. I am now going to be handing over to my colleague, Naledi. So back to you in the studio.